Live Laugh Larceny discusses true petty crimes that may be disturbing to some. Or could be easy listening to all you psychopaths out there. All stories are based on actual events. Eh, but details may vary. Listener discretion is not advised. Welcome to Live Laugh Larceny, using your one free phone call to prank your ex. <laughs> this is Trevin. And I'm Amanda. What a mood do you have to be in for that to be your one <laughs> phone call? It would be pretty awesome, honestly. <laughs> Ballsy. Yes. So Trevin, what is your dreadful dilemma this week? My dreadful dilemma has to do with a new TV show I'm into. Oh, yes. What is it? So... I got Emily an iPad for Christmas, and that got us a three-month thing for Apple TV+. Plus. Okay. But I had been wanting to watch Severance for a long time. Okay. And I finally watched it, and I got so hooked on this show, way more than I ever thought I was going to get hooked on this show. I absolutely love it. It's like if Black Mirror and Twilight Zone got together and made a show that was all about hating working in corporate America. Okay, <laughs> so this is perfect. It's This perfect. is exactly what you needed. Do you know anything about this show? No, I've heard the name. So the premise of the show is, would you work a job that could kind of shut off your brain when you're at work and so you never have to actually go through a work day? So to you... You open up the door, go into work, and the next thing you know, you're walking right back out. Weird. And so eight hours go by. And do you get paid a lot or no? (laughs) I don't know. They don't talk about pay. Really? I assume he lives off of it as a single guy in the show. So yeah. Okay. So you get paid well. Okay. That's the only thing I ever knew. I was like, I just want to watch a show about this because like, that's a good question I ask myself. The show gets really deep in what all that would really mean because it's called being severed or the severance thing. So what that means is it severs the work side of your brain from the life side of your brain. Right. But very early in the show, right in the first like five minutes, they pose the question, yes, you do that, but it sections off a part of your brain where like a whole different you lives and that's just your work version. So as much as you would say, oh, for me, it's fun to walk into work and the next thing I know, I'm walking right back out of work. This other version of you walks out of work and immediately walks right back into work because they don't, experience the outside of oh my work god family. it's really 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 interesting and i love it and there's just so many do different they show things both sides then yes oh my god that actually does sound really fascinating and it's interesting too because your inside work version like your work self you almost like wake up with amnesia kind of and then they kind of, you learn who you are as a worker so if that part of your brain only works to work It's only alive to work. Everything you do is very based on work. So like the quotes of the boss are almost like Bible scriptures that they live by because it's supposed to, you know, keep them on the task and keep working. Because if my job could make me be 100% for work in that work building, they would almost be very culty. You know what I mean? Yeah. They would say like, nothing matters more to you than making this sale. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that's almost how it works too, is they're just fed everything about this company to believe in. Cause that's the only thing they, they know. So let me ask you this. Does the boss have two different people? Oh, that's what you'd have to watch more. Okay. 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 I, I'll give you the premise, but I'm not going to give you anything else. Cause there's almost kind of a mystery aspect to it too. Because the main guy is played by Adam Scott. Okay. The dude from Parks and Rec. Uh huh. And his inside version is wondering what his outside life is like. And the outside life guy kind of didn't care at first, but then he starts to kind of wonder like what goes on in there, but he can't find out, you know, because it's almost like a switch flips when you go inside the building. Whoa. Okay. That is so freaking fascinating. Oh, I love it so much. It's so good. So why is this dreadful? Well, I finished the first season. Oh, God. I hate it when that happens. I keep seeing articles about filming and getting the second season done. 
And I just got to know. I got to <laughs> like there were so many episodes where they would end on like a cliffhanger. And I haven't felt that way in a show in a long time where I'm like, I got to have the next one. Yeah. I mean, like back when I was a kid, when serialized TV was at its like peak where you had like Breaking Bad and you had Dexter. Yeah. And shows like that. Weeds was the first one I ever remembered where it ended on a cliffhanger. So I was like, I need the next episode right now. Mm-hmm. And that was before Netflix was a thing. You just bought the DVD box set and ran through the box set. Oh, do I remember? Yeah. So I haven't felt this way about a show in a long time. And I think there's only eight, maybe nine episodes. And I'm just so ready for more. Because the more further the show goes, the more deep into the world building it is. Ooh, so this could go on for a while, probably. It could go on for a while because they just posed a simple question, but then they really peel it back and be like, well, what would that do for politics? What would that do for this? Mm-hmm. And because the company's basically like Amazon, they run everything. And so there's people that want to protest it and say, this is messed up. You should never do that because what if they try to do that to your brain outside of work? Mm-hmm. And then there's the people that are like, I hate working, so it's a good thing for me. What do you think? Would you do it? No, because I do a lot of reflection and thinking at work. And as much as I hate my job, I get a lot of podcast thinking through. Oh, yeah. And I do a lot of podcast listening that helps give me other ideas. I think I would almost have a little bit of anxiety if you have 24 hours in a day. You work eight hours. You sleep eight hours, let's say. So that's 16 hours. So you're saying that I only get eight hours as a human being. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't think I could do it. No, I don't think I could do it either. And I haven't even watched the show to know (laughs) what their premise of that looks like. But for me, yeah, I have to process a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I like to do that when I'm doing other tasks sometimes. And it doesn't really give you that space. And also, just for me personally, I wouldn't be so trusting to just be like, yep, do with me what you will. You know, like, I want to know everything that's going on with me. Thank you very much. Yeah, exactly. Because you don't know what you walk your body in to do. Mm -mm. Nope, nope, nope. I don't think I could handle it. But it's so good. And and the funny thing is some of the people hate their lives inside of there because all they do is know the office. You know, I think to myself, oh, I just walked into work. Oh, no, I'm the work version of me. Man, I hate my life in this building. (laughs) And then when I leave, I almost kind of block it out and forget about it which gives me the ability to enjoy my night and then to march forward on in time until I have to go back in that building again. Right. Wow. That is dreadful. I highly recommend. I hope that your newest season comes out sooner than later. Me too. Well, I also have a dreadful dilemma. Mine isn't nearly as deep thinking to it. It's something that needs to be done. I just don't want to do it. One of those kind of things. Laundry. Um, well, God, that is on my list every week of dreadful tasks. But no, I recently went shopping and bought myself a new pair of jeans. It was, what, over a week ago that I told you about this? Mm-hmm. I still have not returned them because when I bought them, the security tag was left on. Yeah, that's right. And, uh, you know, I have so many reasons for why I haven't taken them back. First of all... I immediately trashed my receipt, don't have the receipt on it. I don't want to go in there and then they think that I stole the pants. I know they probably won't, but what if? Mm -hmm. And then also, I'm just too lazy to go and do it. It already took a lot of effort for me to go and buy these pants. Now I have to go back into the store just to get this damn thing off. And would you be able to do this with the kids? Because that would be another thing that would keep me from wanting to do is if I had to take both the girls. Exactly. Most likely I will, unless one's in preschool or someone's babysitting the other one. But I would probably have to take them, Mm -hmm. at least one of them. And so Jordan and I, you know, we've looked up all these different hacks online of how to get it off from home. None of them have worked so far. So if anyone knows any, I mean, by the time this episode comes out, hopefully I will have just gone to the damn store. Oh God, I hope by then. (laughs) You know that, or you're just stuck with a pair of pants you're never going to wear. Oh my God. Isn't that kind of how anxiety over weird tasks goes though? Yes. You overthink it. You make a bunch of dumb excuses. It becomes a much bigger deal than what it needs to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You're sitting there dreading it and it just isn't that big of a deal. It's not that big of a deal at all. I find myself going through that a lot. Before I started my Etsy store, I was so anxious about having to ship things, Mm -hmm. which I still am. Do not get it twisted. But it's actually something that I've had to do so often now that it's becoming less of a thing. But this one, I mean, I never have to go and do this. So it's still a thing right now. Yeah. Mailing stuff is kind of weird for me. When I used to live at my old townhouse, you had to pay with either check or 
Oh, yeah. Money order thingy. Money order. I got to know the USPS store really well. Yep. Yep. God. See, I just hate it. I hate all these little things that you have to do. But there it is. That's life in America. (laughs) So we are going to be exchanging some killer facts this week. Hello? We traced the facts. They're coming from inside the house. Killer facts. We are, and I've got one for you. I'm ready. It's kind of a little quick one, but did you know they almost attempted to try to bring George Washington back to life? Is this the way you fucking pick? Get out. (laughs) Oh, my God. You know what's so funny about this? My dad sent this to me and I was like, this is so Trevin's type of fact here where mm-hmm. the being history and everything. <laughs> this has never happened before. Please. Will you do it though? Because you'll do a much better job. Wow. We made it a hundred episodes <laughs> and then 101. <laughs> we both had the same killer fact. <gasps> Go for it. Just keep going. Wow. So George Washington basically said that he wanted to see the year 1800. And he had gotten pretty ill, and he knew that he was about to die soon, but he was just like, I really want to make it to 1800. So he ended up dying officially on December 14th, 1799. It was from a viral infection of the throat. Okay. He only had it for about two days, and then he died. So he, did, he really wanted to make it to 1800, and his friend William Thornton was a physician, and he just really wanted to help make George Washington's dream a reality of making it to 1800. Okay. So he was trying to get people to agree. Because at first, George Washington was really scared of being buried alive. Mm. He didn't want to be put in a tomb yet because he was like, I might just come out of this thing. Yeah. He wanted to hold off. I might come back to life. You never know. Yeah. Which we've talked about before with the safety coffins and stuff that Mm -hmm. even though I don't think there was a lot of proof of it ever happening, I think it was just stories they told each other. And so it was a big fear of people. Please don't let me be buried alive. Yeah. So his friend William Thornton was like, well, I'm going to help my buddy. I want to resuscitate him and make zombie George Washington, basically. I mean, why? But yes, go on. He was going to kind of try to be there by the time he died to help him out. But it turns out that on William's way to see George Washington, George Washington had already died. So by the time he got there, he was a cold, stiff corpse. Mm, Hate it when that happens. Right. And this was kind of obviously old school way of thinking. He thought, okay, well, he died because he needed air because he stopped breathing, Mm -hmm. which is like a dumb joke my dad always says. (laughs) They go, oh, I didn't know they died when they died, my dad says, when they stopped breathing. Oh, God. So the guy says, George Washington obviously died because he didn't have air and it made his body cold and not want to work. So he was like, we need to bring him back with heat and we need to give him air. And then he was going to also transplant lamb blood into him. That's the part that really grabbed me. I did see this <laughs> this fact. But yeah, so really his whole thought process was just like, hmm, what has caused this death? No air. He's cold. He's cold right now. Mm-hmm. And uh what was the whole thing with the lamb blood again? I think they just said he lost blood. He before. lost blood. Yeah. So he's like, okay, I'm just going to do the exact opposite and we'll just see how this plays out. Yeah, it's kind of gross to think about, but it's like, oh, you're a weird meat balloon. I'm going to start blowing air into you. And he wanted to slowly warm him up with blankets and cool water that was obviously warmer than his dead body temperature. Yeah. And then he wanted to eventually start warming his body up with the water and blankets and blowing more air and forcing his dead body to breathe again and also just giving him some lamb blood to fill him back out i guess you know what might as well but (laughs) eventually everybody was like maybe you should set this one out william yeah i think we're not gonna do that yeah because like didn't his family once they heard it all they were like no you can see yourself out like they didn't even let him start this whole thing right they were like "Mm, no i don't remember ever seeing exactly how that went but yeah they just said yeah we're not gonna do that which is funny because they said later they interviewed him like 20 years later and he was just like there's no doubt in my mind we could have done it and i'm like okay mister what (laughs) how come you didn't just bring a different body back to life then if you think it's so easy It's just like, oh, yeah, I have this theory. It can only work on the president. Yeah, this guy is delusional. (laughs) Yeah, if you want to be a mad scientist, just go prove them wrong by bringing somebody else back to life. Yeah, if you're so certain about this, you could really prove it if you had that 
big of certainty. Yeah. So William Thornton did say without a doubt in his mind, he would have been able to bring him back to life. Wow. That is a lot of confidence in something so specific and weird. Yeah, it's nutty. It's a nutty belief to have. And like I said, you could have just proved it on somebody else. I'm really glad they didn't do that. (sighs) Clearly, George Washington was friends with this guy. Clearly, he liked him. Mm -hmm. But I don't know. I feel like if he really thought this through properly, he wouldn't have wanted this for himself even, right? I don't know. It seemed like he was afraid of death and he really wanted to make it to 1800. Yeah, that's true. Who knows? Which I don't know. It's 1800's just a number. You know what I mean? I know. 1800's <laughs> the new 1776. <laughs> I know. I know. You lived a good life, dude. Yeah. You were the first president. Like, there is nothing more you needed to see, okay? You did it. Yeah. And I heard about that New Year's Eve. Nothing special. Yeah. You know what? Dick Clark was still there, though. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we could all hope to stay alive for that, I guess. Maybe that's why. Yeah, very weird. Super weird. Well, that was also going to be my idea. <laughs> <laughs> so anybody see any good movies? <laughs> so how about that weather? Let's just go with this, Trevin. All right, guys. So obviously we took a tiny break to figure out what our second one will be. <laughs> How silly. (laughs) Wow, how ridiculous. But you know what's so great is that there is always a killer fact to be found. Oh, so true. So I am coming at you all from one of my favorite websites that I find my facts at, and that is Ripley's.com. Oh, God, you love Ripley's. God, I love them. So did you know, Trevin, that recently in the year of 2022... A group of eight skydivers over the age of 80 broke a record. They're still observing the video and documenting it. Oh, wow. Yeah, because at the very end, it says videos and photos of this jump are being processed currently by Guinness World Records. So they take this shit seriously. They do their due diligence. This group of eight skydivers over the age of 80 have broken a world record for the largest formation of jumpers over the age of 80. Wow. So I didn't even know that it had to be this specific. I didn't realize there were so many skydivers in the world over the age of 80. Mm -hmm. But apparently it is a thing. The previous record that was the standing winner was a formation of six people. And they were all over 80. And this is the group of eight. So you know what? Still counts. (laughs) (laughs) They won. That is showing a really great effort to everyone involved. So one of the skydivers named Cliff Davis was quoted in saying, We are proud to represent our sport with a demonstration that illustrates how the skills and expertise of our team is timeless and always evolving. Damn. So, okay, you know what? I have to give all of them credit because not only are they 80, but mm-hmm. they are evolving and they are free falling and they are doing it with style and breaking records. So, I mean, <laughs> there's nothing killer about this. They are all actually still living their lives to the fullest. That's but true. I did find it to be a very interesting fact. It's very weird how some of these world records are so specific sometimes. I know. It's like, why can't I be the guy who drank the most water while having a piercing made out of (laughs) belly button lint? (laughs) You know? You know what, Trevin? You should probably look that up and see if there's a world record and maybe you can beat it. And then I'll send a video of myself doing it to Guinness. I know. They have the most specific ones sometimes. Yeah, most people over 80. How about the most people over 60 but under 70? You know you what know? I mean? Like can you pull that one too? And do we have an above 90 category? Any takers? Yeah. I mean, shit. If we're going to go world records, I think above 90 could knock this out of the park. Yeah, I think just doing one guy above 90. <laughs> But for real, for real, that's good for them. I sometimes am scared to ride roller coasters. I think that the anxiety would spike so much that I would have a heart attack and die. (laughs) And I'm 33. Right. So for them to be 80 and say, I think I can take that. Good on them because just the self-talk 
I'm afraid I would manifest a heart attack in this guy. And I'm just a person. I've only done skydiving one time ever. I was in my early 20s. I don't know if I've said it on this show, but I had a totally fine and safe experience. It was in Las Vegas and they did such a great job. But I have told this to Jordan repeatedly. I've said, yes, I had a great experience that one and one time alone. I will never do it again. Mm -hmm. It scares me more now that I've done it than before I even did it because I know the feeling. So not only have they just jumped and done the skydiving, but they made a formation in the air. That's true. They weren't just screaming uncontrollably until they got to the surface. (laughs) No, it wasn't just a group of screaming elders. It was they made a freaking formation. Like, what? Props to them, because I was just one of the screaming banshees when I went down. I thought about trying one of those indoor skydiving places just to see what it feels like, but not have to look down at my doom. Yeah. The flight up there is really a huge mind fuck. Not even going to lie. Yeah. There's no turning back. No turning back. And you just keep getting higher. Yeah. I think I'd probably do indoor skydiving. I guess why not? I've done the outdoor one, right? I don't know. Yeah. I mean, if they turn off the machine, you're just going to fall on your tummy. (laughs) Yeah. yeah. (laughs) And not splat. (laughs) Damn. Well... Those were some facts. And like I said, this was a live, laugh, larceny first, where we both came with the same one. Yeah. Wow. Write How that in your record wild. books for us. Yeah, Guinness. Where's our record? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Are we ready for some ads, Trevin? I'm ready to be told to buy something. Let's do it. <laughs> this show is sponsored by BetterHelp. I feel like I am constantly learning new things about myself. I recently realized that I love the color pink. I always thought it was too girly, but now I see the power and wear it often. Getting to know yourself can be a lifelong process, especially because we're always growing and changing. It wasn't until just recently that I learned that I have an eating disorder, and working through that would have never been possible without therapy. Therapy is all about deepening your self-awareness and understanding, because sometimes we don't know what we want or why we react the way we do. Until we talk things through. BetterHelp connects you with a licensed therapist who can take you on the journey of self-discovery from wherever you are. Personally, therapy has taught me many positive coping skills and how to set boundaries I feel good about. If you are thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist and switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Discover your potential with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash live laugh today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash live laugh. Bye. See ya. All right. So now it's on to story time. Woohoo! And I'm pretty excited. Although I will say... That I had a bit of an attitude when I wrote this story. Ooh. Full disclosure, or if I was a corporate manager, I would say full transparency. Oh, for God's sake. You know, we said this just last week that we're always going to be emotionally honest with you guys and let you know what we're going through. Mm -hmm. And there's no coincidence that there may be some attitude in my writing here. So let's just jump on into this thing and let's see if you can spot some of my uh, shade. Okay, I'm ready. And here... We go. Nothing compares to the hopeless feelings of working for a bad boss. You come into a place you don't even want to go to, and to make matters worse, you're subjected to a person whose personality can best be described as abysmal. Chop, chop, get to work. I know, I know. I keep finding different ways to bring up work topics. But give me a pass this week. I'm going through something. For me, I find kindness to be one of the most important qualities that a person can possess. You look nice today. Thanks. We are all wandering around the earth, trying our best, and we all suffer from feelings of inadequacy. So why would you choose to make things harder on other people? This is especially true when it comes to your job. We are born into a world that commands you to find a way to contribute. And if you can't, you have no worth. The all-important rat race. The American dream. Whether you like it or not, you have to find a way to fit into whatever shape is necessary to making a living. 
File down all your rough edges. Pretend to be another person. Hi, I'm Chuck. Or mute your personality entirely. You will find a way to fit the mold of what your employer is looking for for at least 40 hours a week. I've lost myself, but I've gained a paycheck. Unfortunately, this is not a two-way street. You are expected to bring a willingness to a job you care nothing about, while your employer hires power-hungry dickbags who force their unhealthy worldviews on you. Why can't you drink a beer like a real man? As long as numbers are looking good, the manager of the highest power can be looked upon as a great motivator. Get out there and do work! After all, the man up top only cares about the money being funneled into his pockets, not your family or your mental health. Please, sir, can I have some more? This allows the management to reach these goals by any means necessary. Hollow promises, fake conversations, and mind games become a daily routine. Hopes are raised and perks are given Thanks. before quickly being taken right back. <laughs> all of this is done with the intent of sending a message to all of the lower level workers. You are soulless cattle and you will obey or go live on the streets. Did I mention I'm going through something? The petty story I prepared for you has to do with one of these corporate merchants of death. A low level henchman set out to do a company's dark bidding by working directly with the peons in which the enterprise runs. Humanity is lost, dreams are crushed, and life is monopolized. So take your self-worth and put it on the clearance rack at a second-rate thrift store, because we are about to go to work. Seriously, I'm not okay. Julia was the great overseer of her local Olive Garden in Overland Park, Kansas. Her walls were lined with commemorative plaques for awards such as Best Manager, Highest Earnings Earner, and Harshest Dictator. When the suits up top came to visit her location, they showered her with praise and brought her free lunches. You go, Julia. Thanks for the bonus last month. And I can't believe you got those stupid workers of yours to do such a great job, were accolades that she often received. Although Julia was considered beloved in the eyes of her management, those who worked below her couldn't have felt more differently. For every award given to her to honor her monthly sales numbers, a different voodoo doll was made by her employees to honor her stupid face. From the top looking down, Julia was a powerhouse of motivation who made things happen. They didn't ask questions and money kept flowing in. She had a gift. She knew how to communicate with the commoners who actually ran the restaurant. Work harder, idiot. That alone was worthy of praise. No upper management person would be caught dead talking to the lower level employees. Ew, yucky. There was a commonly shared superstition amongst them that the slightest conversation with them could lead to financial strain. Those people oozed debt. Conversely, the workers at the bottom viewed Julia as a hell spawn who fed off the pain of their fellow comrades. What looked like a three-star restaurant that brings unlimited breadsticks and gives extra cheese on the outside was a battlefield of emotion on the inside. Together, the shift workers took up arms and made a unified front in the battle against the giant fire-breathing Julia. Employees would take up the front lines, on, using doctor's notes as weapons while Julia countered back with attacks of mandatory overtime and denied vacation requests. The battle never stopped, and Julia never tired from the fight. This was just how the business ran throughout Julia's career. It was a constant push-pull relationship between her and her employees. People would quit or get fired, and a new group of hires would come in to continue where the others left off. But the war between Julia and her team would hit a new challenge in December of 2022. Julia walked in to supervise the preparation for the dinner rush. She unlocked her office door, sat her stuff down, and went to look over her herd. Immediately, she could sense a disturbance in the kitchen's balance. Over all her years as a manager, she was able to break herself from the habit of viewing her employees as humans with individual needs. In fact, she could no longer see any discernible features between them at all. Her manager vision had evolved to seeing just heat signatures, much like the Predator. Stepping into the kitchen, her eyes scanned the workstations. 
tracking the amount of warm bodies currently laboring in the name of Italian cuisine. Her calculations came back. Three humans were detected, but four were required for a smooth dinner shift. Perhaps one is away in the bathroom, she thought to herself, before taking two quick sniffs to pick up on the scent of an otherwise hidden employee. (laughs) Nope. Just these three are here. All right, cattle. Who's missing? Julia announced to the room. The kitchen workers all began to speak up and gave different answers. Victoria called in sick. I hear she has the flu pretty bad, one faceless employee said. Thanks for your cooperation, noodle cook number one, Julia said, before walking back to her office. The sad boy got back to stirring his boiling pot of water before saying under his breath, It's Ted. Getting to her desk, Julia picked up her phone and decided to call the worker known as Victoria to see just how sick she is. Hey, Julia. I'm sorry. I'm just really... sick. I'll try to make tomorrow's shift, Victoria said, before abruptly getting off the phone. Julia couldn't believe it. I saw better acting at my seven-year-old niece's elementary school play of a Christmas carol. And she sucked, she said to herself. Quickly skimming the employee phone list, she decided to call Toby in. (laughs) Hey, Julia. I'm sorry I can't talk right now. I'm currently at my dog's funeral, and I'm up next to give his eulogy. I've been rehearsing all day, but I don't know if I can do it. Let me try again. He was a Good. <laughs> Julia immediately hung up on the crying kid. Wow, this one was a worse actor than the first, she said to herself. How could these selfish little shits have anything going on in their lives other than Olive Garden? If no one is going to do the honor of delivering 4,000 calorie meals to ungrateful Americans, then I guess it's up to me. She then popped the top off of her 32 ounce bottle of corporate Kool Aid and began to chug. Once every last drop had been consumed, she lit a candle and began to chant the quote of her founder, Olivia Gardenias. When you're here, your family. When you're here, your family. When you're here, your family. Moments later, a possessed Julia exploded out of the manager's office, eyes full of rage and lips stained with corporate Kool-Aid. Let's make some fucking chicken parm, she said to the rest of the workers. For the rest of the night, Julia tossed salads, breaded chicken breasts, mixed Alfredo sauce, and poured free samples of the shitty cheap wine that no one orders. She cut her hand on a burnt breadstick, stubbed her toe on the prep table, and was forced to remake the same order three different times for a picky customer. By the end of it all, Julia had enough. Her patience had been tested. She was physically hurting from the demands of the job, and she mentally just didn't feel happy. Once she got home for the night, all she wanted to do was fall into the couch and die. It was at that moment she had an epiphany. Wow, she said to her empty living room. I guess all of this time at the top made me forget just how difficult the job is. The customers are rude. The food is dangerous. And it's nonstop work. Maybe we do need to make some changes. But as Julia began to see the light, and feel sympathy for those who did this on a regular basis. Her corporate darkness seeped in, clouding her judgment. I never should have had to endure this terrible work in the first place. I'm a manager, for God's sake. This would have never happened to me if those ungrateful workers didn't find things to be more important than working at Olive Garden. With what little energy she had left, Julia decided to pull out some of her signature motivational tactics. She immediately grabbed her laptop, logged into her work account, and began typing an email to all of her employees. When you're here, you're family, she said to herself as she dived into her keyboard. The following morning, employees woke up to the sight of a new email from Julia. One by one, each person was shocked at what was waiting for them. Our call-offs are occurring at a staggering rate. From now on, if you call off, you might as well go out and look for another job. We are no longer tolerating any excuse for calling off. If you're sick, you need to come prove it to us. If your dog died, you need to bring him in and prove it to us. 
If it's a family emergency and you can't say, too bad, go work somewhere else. If you only want morning shifts, too bad, go work at the bank. If anyone from here on out calls out more than once in the next 30 days, you will not have a job. Do you know in my 11 and a half years at Darden how many days I called off? Zero. I came in sick. I got in a wreck literally on my way to work one time. Airbags went off and my car was totaled. But you know what? I made it to work. On time. There are no more excuses. Us, collectively, as a management team, have had enough. If you don't want to work here, don't. It's as simple as that. If you're here and want to work, then work. No more complaining about not being cut or not being able to leave early. You're in the restaurant business. Do you think I want to be here until midnight on Friday and Saturday? No. I'd much rather be at home with my husband and dog, going to the movies or seeing family. But I don't. I'm dedicated to being here. As should you. No more excuses or complaints. I hope you choose to continue to work here, and I think we, the management, make it as easy as we can on y'all. Thank you for your time, and thank you to those who choose to come in every day on time and work hard. I wish there were more like you. Together, the employees forwarded the email to upper management and different news outlets. In the beginning part of December 2022, an angry Olive Garden manager sent an email to all employees threatening to fire anyone that calls in to work. The manager is quoted as saying, If you call off, you might as well go look for another job. And... If you're sick, you need to come prove it to us. If your dog died, you need to bring him in and prove it to us. The email also went on with the manager admitting to working in the restaurant while sick and telling the workers that they too should show the same kind of work ethic. After news outlets got a hold of the email, an Olive Garden media relations representative confirmed that the email is real and came from the manager of their Overland Park, Kansas location, along with assuring everyone that the manager has been fired. The manager was able to keep her anonymity from the press, but hopefully the word is out enough within the restaurant community that she can be kept from holding any more jobs in management. I'm sure you've all had a bad boss. I know I have. I've had plenty. You've probably had worse than this. The sad thing is that our system is set up to keep breeding poor managers because the only thing that people in power see is the money. It's so easy to turn a blind eye to those being mistreated when it doesn't affect you. And when asked to lose a little bit of profits in the name of making life easier for those that serve them, most employers will not even consider it. Hell, maybe even if it doesn't cost anything at all. What's in it for someone who already has it all to allow the smallest people just a little more comfort? I can only hope that one day, businesses can take a more human approach to the way they view their employees. But for that to happen, a lot is going to have to change. Because you're never going to change the hearts of the greedy, and profits over people will always serve them better. So in closing, yes, I'm going through something. And I can't help but blame myself a little because I thought a corporate entity could change. I am definitely in the fool me twice, shame on me stage of things. But I hope you and I can all find a fulfilling way of life and still be able to support ourselves. I know that's easier said than done, but you have my support because I think we are all a little tired of the fat cats hogging all the cream. So if you can't get any cream for yourself, put laxatives in the cream you can't have, or something. What do I know? I'm going through something. (laughs) You okay, my dude? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm better. Wow. So we haven't done a local to Kansas City area crime in a while, I feel like. I think your poopy wigs one, right? Because yeah, that was more that recent was than Wichita. my Dairy Queen one. Yeah, but that was still Wichita, Kansas. I mean, it was in Kansas. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but that was a while ago. Yeah. And very recent, too. Yeah, I found this on a local news station thing, and I held on to it. I said, I'll come back to this. I'm not feeling inspired for it right now. Yeah. Luckily, I was able to use my own issues to kind of bring this one up. But what was cool was when I went to go look it up more, by that point, it was a worldwide news thing, and like everybody was talking about it. Because when I first saw it, it literally was just the first day KCTV5 was talking about it. Damn. What's insane to me about the whole thing... And I know you have, and I have as well, and I'm sure most people listening have as well. Everyone's had a boss that believes these things that this lady said, right? Mm -hmm. Everybody has had a boss that's like, 
I don't care if you're sick. Come in, come in, come in, regardless of the weather, regardless of this, regardless of that. We've all worked for somebody who's just totally on this weird, creepy level. Mm -hmm. But to have it actually in writing in an email, that's another level. Yeah, there are things that the job you and I used to work together on. I saw some shit. I saw some tantrums for the guy who ran the entire building. Yeah. And it was the most unprofessional, weirdest, almost give you PTSD kind of stuff, seeing a grown man freak out like this. Uh Uh-huh. And... There's no way of proving that. You know, exactly. I could have never done anything. But when you have somebody just rant an email like that and Ooh. put it in the hands of the people that want to hurt her the most. Yeah, that was so <laughs> stupid. <laughs> oh, my God. So awkward. And the fact that the part of the email where she said, if your dog dies, you have to bring them in <laughs> yeah. for proof. The fact that that was actual words. Freaks me out. Yeah, which, you know, deep down she probably didn't actually mean that, but... Why would you say that? What if somebody did? You know what I mean? Like, what if somebody was like, I gotta do what my boss says? Oh, my God. Somebody comes a wheelbarrow in with a dead dog right in front of Olive Garden. Like, what? Wow. 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 She kept her anonymity. We never got her name. She got fired. Mm. That's about the main thing. The whole news thing was just that whole email verbatim, which I did read that. Everything else was made up before that. But yeah. I was just kind of wanting to do my own thing, talking <laughs> about the classes of power and stuff like that. Unfortunately, you're probably not far off. I mean, I don't think there's an actual Kool-Aid that people drink, but maybe there is. Maybe there's an actual corporate Kool-Aid. Oh, God. And they would drink it, too. <laughs> it started as a joke, and then that would be what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For sure. Wow. The word choices are just really doing it for me. And like Like I said, though, as shocking as they are, I really think that that just kind of gives us a weird, bizarre glimpse into the minds of bosses out there. Mm -hmm. And it's crazy because we were kind of talking about this whole thing before we recorded today about how now is the time in life where workers are really saying, hey, I deserve more because there's a lot of jobs out there right now. Mm -hmm. And for this woman to do it after the pandemic during recent times? Yeah, I feel like she was probably already working with a short staff. That was really dumb, really poor, poor timing. I don't know. For all the bosses out there that are wanting to just let their wild, controlling, evil sides out, I mean, I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't. I probably wouldn't, yeah. I think a lot of companies are on damage control so much with PR stuff. Mm -hmm. And even if it's a company that maybe isn't the most honest or caring to their people, they still work the PR angle to make sure that nobody knows that they suck. Mm -hmm. So when somebody goes public with something like that and represents your brand, they got to make themselves look better by doing that. Yeah, and I really love Olive Garden, so that breaks my heart. Mm, We had some that last weekend, I think. Oh, God, especially because this is a local news story. I'm going to be looking at all the workers like, you doing okay? (laughs) <laughs> you doing all right there? Oh, man. Yeah, I, I want to say that to most customer service people anyway. That's so freaking true. God. God, for all of our service workers out there listening, we love you. We salute you. <laughs> wow. What a story, Trevin. There was some anger in my words. There was. But, you know, as much as you've been going on with your whole situation in life, I think it was tastefully done. Thank you. I try not to get totally childish with what i mean childish i guess but (laughs) being childish is the best yeah but i will try to keep my capitalism talks to a minimum now since i kind of ran it out of my system this week there you go there you have it ladies and gents well i also have a story for you all Mm -hmm. so this is another story from the news and the whole time you were telling your story i was trying to be like oh connections connections And there are some pretty vague overlapping ones, but I'm curious to see if you can come up with anything a little more specific. Okay. And, you know, I think I'm just going to jump right into this one. So uh, here we go. As I have grown and matured, I've realized just how important marketing is. When you really think about it, marketing is a part of almost everything we do. Not only does it affect the food we eat, clothes we wear, and music we listen to, but you can even market yourself. 
Just look at LinkedIn or any dating app for proof. This fish is gonna make me look so desirable. Even recently, Jesus himself has hired a new marketing team. But believe it or not, there are a few unfortunate souls in the world that don't get many opportunities to market their goods or services, turning some desperate entrepreneurs into petty criminals. 50-year-old John Balmer lived in Hudson, Florida in 2015 and was constantly looking for new ways to gain more clients. Come buy from me. He had quality product, pristine customer service, Have a good day. and great deals. The only issue is that his field of work was frowned upon by the law. This prevented John from utilizing popular marketing outlets to procure more clients. It was tough having the occupation of a drug dealer. Sure, John had his regulars that would only buy drugs from him, like Stoner Steve and Tweaker Tony, but that still wasn't enough to afford his below average lifestyle. He needed to get creative and find a way to spread the word about his business without getting arrested. As John sat mindlessly scrolling on his phone, he saw an ad for a t-shirt. A t-shirt that could solve every single one of his problems. In big white lettering, the t-shirt read, Who Needs Drugs? In bold capital letters. And underneath it, it read, No, seriously, I have drugs. In slightly smaller letters. It was perfect. John purchased the shirt in his size without hesitation and eagerly awaited its arrival. The shirt arrived on a brisk day in January, and John immediately tore open the package and tried it on. It fit like a glove. Now it was time to test his newest marketing strategy out on the public, and he knew exactly where to go. John grabbed a bag of drugs and his car keys and headed towards Kmart. When John entered the store, he immediately noticed other shoppers reading his shirt. Oh my. He puffed out his chest, proud of his brilliant plan already. Now he just had to find some interested new clients. John walked up and down the Kmart aisles, making eye contact and raising his eyebrows repeatedly at the other shoppers. Eh? But so far, no one had actually purchased any drugs from him. Eventually, John's optimism about his plan began to dwindle. He had walked every aisle of the Kmart six times and was beginning to feel like the other shoppers were scared of him for some reason. What, do these people not like drugs? So John made his way back to the front of the store. He grabbed a candy bar and got in line to check out in defeat. Oh. Just as it was almost his turn to purchase his sweet treat, a sheriff's deputy walked into the store. John froze in panic. He tried to reassure himself that surely the deputy wasn't there for him. But wearing a walking drug dealer billboard on his chest made his paranoia all-consuming. John felt the bag of drugs in his pant pocket, and he knew he had to get rid of any evidence just in case. He turned to the woman in line behind him, offering her the bag of drugs. Yo, you want some drugs? But she just scowled at him and scoffed. He awkwardly turned back around to the cashier to buy his candy bar. Still with the drugs in hand, John casually and slowly placed the bag on the ground in front of him and checked out. Now, he only had to make it out of the store so he could go back to his marketing drawing board. John was almost to the front doors when he heard the gruff voice of the sheriff's deputy behind him. Freeze, Mr. Drug Haver. In early January of 2015, 50-year-old John Balmer entered a Hudson, Florida Kmart wearing a shirt with the following message. Who needs drugs? No, seriously, I have drugs. As the local sheriff's deputy entered the store, John tried to pass a bag full of drugs to the person behind him in the checkout line. When that person refused, he placed the drugs on the ground before checking out and trying to leave. Store employees told the deputy about the bag, and John was arrested at the scene. He was charged with possession of methamphetamine, 
and a further charge of possession of less than 20 grams of marijuana. But arguably, the worst punishment of all was the Pasco County Sheriff's Office trolling John on their Facebook page. After his arrest, they posted a photo of him looking embarrassed in front of a toy claw machine with the words on his shirt in clear view. They captioned the post saying, Oh, the irony! 50-year-old John Balmer was arrested and charged with possession of meth at the Kmart in Hudson. Pay close attention to the t-shirt. In the world of marketing, there are strategies that work, bringing in clients, revenue, and success. Before a petty criminal, marketing can be a slippery slope, turning you into a walking billboard of shame. So for those listening, be warned. And remember, not everything has to be printed on a t-shirt. I mean, I like the idea behind it. (laughs) But maybe don't go to a store? I don't know. Can I please show you this guy and the picture? What I'm imagining probably isn't what it is. Okay. Oh, that scowl. (laughs) He looks so upset. There's the mugshot, too, of him. So, I mean, here he is, literally in the picture that they took. He is standing, and we will post this on social media. So he's standing in front of a toy claw machine wearing the shirt, right? Mm -hmm. And then in the claw machine, you can see the reflection of the police in it. I just thought this photo was so brilliant for obvious reasons and for little hidden reasons, too. Mm -hmm. I can't wait to share it with everyone. But he looks so defeated. He's looking off so embarrassed. You can see the police officers in the reflection. And then, of course, the writing on his shirt. My God. He has a very exaggerated, unhappy face. Yes. Like when people say, turn that frown upside down, I always think like, well, my frown's kind of just a straight mouth, but this guy is like straight up (laughs) like a lowercase N. (laughs) It is the biggest frowny face of all time. (laughs) I agree with that wholeheartedly. When they say that it takes more muscles to frown than the smile, I believe when I look at him. Oh, this took every muscle of this man's (laughs) face. Freaking jaw. Yeah, he's probably tightening his ass cheeks just to make that frown. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can you blame the guy? No. Look how embarrassing this is. He must have known, oh, they're going to tell people. And then they posted it on social media. Like, come on, this poor guy. That's such overcorrection. He probably could have been just fine wearing that shirt and just walked out, not been a fool. It's another petty crime case of overcorrection. Mm-hmm. And it didn't get into it on any of the articles about exactly what was going through this guy's head. Obviously, I kind of, again, did a little wrap up at the end there. Everything about where he was, how it happened, all true. I obviously have no idea what motivated him Mm -hmm. or how he got the shirt, but I did look the shirt up and you can buy it. Yeah. Kind of like when I did my whole bag full of drugs story. It did make me think of that, yeah. It kind of brought me back to this vibe as well. And part of me even was like, should I do this? Because I have done the bag full of drugs. But that was more towards their own organization. Like he was literally using this as a walking billboard for himself. Mm -hmm. And I just found that to be so damn funny. Yeah. So I think one thing that people can learn here is if you are an independent business person, small business owner, Uh don't cut corners with marketing. Oh, yeah, for sure. And I think judging by the weird random TikToks I've seen, those marketing people say the same thing. (laughs) They do. And just me working in the marketing field for a company for years, it really opened my eyes to just how much good marketing can do. And how fake it can really be, too. I mean, we could go on some deep dives about marketing in general. And, you know, do I feel for some people who really can't find their little niche in the marketing world? Yes. But come on, John. (laughs) And also, maybe you could have made that work. And like you said, if you wouldn't have overcorrected, tried to give your drugs to the person in line behind you and then left it weirdly. Mm -hmm. Maybe you wouldn't have even gotten caught even with that walking billboard on your chest. People could think you're just being sarcastic and weird and creepy. 
But yeah, he really ruined that for himself. Yeah. If you're saying it's a regular shirt you can just buy in stores, you can easily just make the argument. Yeah, it's a shirt. I mean, if yeah, and that's not where, where a cop will ask to search your car or something. You need to give them like reason or whatever. Yeah. Re- reasonable doubt. Or and whatever. you also need to give them permission. Yeah. So wearing a shirt is not enough to <laughs> give reasonable doubt. If so, all the kids wearing Bob Marley shirts would be getting exactly. frisked every time they put that shirt on. <laughs> Exactly. Oh, God, you could have gotten away with it, John. But yeah, I just thought with the words on the shirt and the picture is what really grabbed me. I was like, okay, I've got to tell it. Yeah, it's a good face. (laughs) It's a very, very sad face. (laughs) Every time I look at it, I just think of... (laughs) I'm doing like the biggest frown I can do right now. That does take a lot of muscles. It does. Wow. Connections. The vagueness that I was kind of thinking about is that both had to do with what it takes to keep a business going Mm -hmm. and the different strategies of the inner workings of a business. But that's so vague and I couldn't really think of anything else. That's kind of where I was at, like keeping a business running, sort of public relations. Yours is public relations in a marketing sort of standpoint. Mine was Olive Garden trying to cover their ass because of a jackass sending an email. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, anything yeah, business based. It's not one we've ever done before, even That's though true. it's vague. That's true. That's true. The business of petty crime. I don't know. But yeah. it's all just sick and twisted when you really look into it. Boy, deep. you're telling me. Oh, so what a week. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I hope that wherever you are, if you are at work listening or if you are going to work listening or leaving work listening or hell, even if you're working from home or not doing any sort of work at all, I hope that you are having a great week. And I hope you're listening. And I and, <laughs> and you know what? You've got to be listening, right? That's to a hear good this. Point. I know we always say this at the end, but we really do appreciate everyone out there listening, no matter where you are, what you're doing. And uh, yeah, we hope you keep that up. So just remember, no matter the crime, big or small, in the end, we're all doomed. Doomed to be a part of bad business. Bye. See ya. <laughs> So I'm going to head out of here and go grab myself some Olive Garden. But thank you all for listening to our show. And if you've ever wanted to resuscitate a dead president into a zombie, tell us on social media who you choose. Instagram, Facebook, TikTok, and Twitter. Live, laugh, larceny. And we all love to bitch about a bad boss. So send us your true petty crime stories to live, laugh, larceny at gmail.com. And do your best impression of Amanda's criminal John. But instead of wearing a shirt that says, I have drugs, wear a shirt that says, I just gave Live Laugh Larceny five stars. You can do so on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or Good Pods. Let's make some fucking chicken parm. <laughs> <laughs> She said to the rest of the workers. (laughs) I always laugh. There's like more to it. Just a little bit. Oh, God, I love it.